was a Tuesday on the 13th of December, 1467, and Arnold de Vesel was at dinner on a boat moored by the castle at Slaus. After he dined, while amusing himself on soi divisant with the captain, he spotted two small cannons, which seemed to be out of use, and said by way of passing, by way of passing time, par manière de passant, that he'd like to try them out. So he charged one of them and took aim at a mound of earth along the bank. But it happened that the cannon suddenly tilted its angle of fire, and thus its shot of lead sailed out towards the front of the castle gate, where it landed on a pile of hay, but also, unfortunately, on the hidden head of the agent Reverick, the castle's furnace stoker, who thus passed quickly, Arnold tells us, from life to death. Well, this story of the homicide appears in a letter that pardoned Arnaud of his crime. Such pardon letters, specially granted by the Burgundian dukes and the Habsburg successors, applicants in their territories, survive in remarkable number. Over 2,000 detailed ones survived between 1386 and 1520. In them, supplicants cast their behavior in the best possible light, both to secure a princely pardon and to ensure the pardon accepted by their local communities. Usually, supplicants dispatch their victims with weapons less obviously dangerous than cannons, often with harmless bread knives used in self-defense against brutal assault. But one problem for the historian with these stories is that they plead mitigating circumstances of such striking similarity that they become less than credible. But it is useful to reflect on the circumstances that supplicants ev evidently thought would mitigate their crime. And there is one similarity that's worth more attention. Arnold's frankly reckless misadventure had occurred, he claimed, because he had wanted to pass the time. The phrase appears in 39 other pardon cases, and it's meant to allude to the supplicant being in a state of recreation. There are 65 letters in which supplicants specifically claim to be in recreation, and of these, seven use the phrase passing time and recreation concurrently. This may not seem to be very many, but as I'll comment on a minute, in, in a minute, the allusion to recreation is much more common in pardon letters than first appears. So one purpose of this paper is to reflect on what the emphasis in pardon letters on recreation might tell us about its wider social importance. There is valuable scholarship on medieval recreation discussed in literature or in treatises, as it was defined among clerics and other social elites. Also on medieval play or games, recently as paradigms to understand the world. But there is a rather less on the wider social significance of notions of recreation and their deployment in contexts that relate more directly to the experiences of humbler groups in society. Pardon letters, for all their fabrications, have more to tell us in this regard. And as such, they may also shed a finger of light on a broader question, too broad really for a short paper, on the nature of medieval recreation and how it differed from later ideas of leisure. It's still often said that modern notions of free time or leisure as a social activity distinct from work only began in the post-medieval era. And a transition towards these notions was argued signaled from the 16th century onwards by a growing interest in the value of specific gains and leisure time. Medievalists delight, of course, in patiently explaining to early modernists that phenomena thought to originate after 1500 were in fact in full and plain operation well before. Well, I'll resist the temptation. After all, the humble supplicants in late medieval pardon letters offer no theoretical discussion on recreation. But they do indicate a social context which questions on how one spent one's time outside of work were already of considerable importance. But before, before 
explaining how supplicants made allusions to recreation, we might remind ourselves as to why they did so. In legal terms, to avoid the charge of murder, as opposed to homicide, supplicants needed to show that their intentions had not been murderous. Typically, they did this by aligning their pre-homicidal activities with one of three hallowed modes of behaviour, sanctioned by the schoolmen. Some claimed to have been at work, going about their honest labour. Others recalled a recent visit to church, or even pyramid shrine. But many had been following a third path of recreation. A few supplicants actually managed to complete the triple. Jerich Bogart, for instance, a poor man from the Castell region, ended an evening in July 1503 with his bread knife planted in another man's chest. But he had begun it, he said, by attending High Mass and by meeting some friends and neighbours for a discussion on a matter of business and for a quiet drink. Most supplicants mention their involvement in just one of these modes of social behaviour. And a very good reason for referring to recreation was its importance in scholastic discourse, even though recreation was secondary to labour and divine service. It was natural and divinely ordered, and it permitted one to work harder or to pray better. And this clear understanding of recreation enjoyed wide, wider currency beyond the schools. And in fact, some supplicants in these pardon letters claimed they'd been about to return to their work after their recreation activity. But schoolmen were less clear on what recreation was and how it might be identified. Aquinas referred to the beneficial effects of delight and what that came from pleasant amusement. And he referred to two types of games, or rather, that generated such joy. There was a third and dishonest type, but Aquinas only described this somewhat vaguely as including games practised in theatres to provoke luxuries. Other schoolmen and homilists eagerly supplied the details, listing a host of dishonest games, notably dicing. So it was that in texts targeted at elite lay people, for instance, Giles of Rome's De Red Gimine Principum, a copy of which was owned by the Good of Burgundy, princes were urged to rest, to be joyeux and espadon, and to find the virtue of joyosity in games and feasts. And so it was too uh, that one of Duke Philip's books of hunting contrasted the virtues of the stag serving God with the vices of the war among which were dicing and tavern going. But despite the, despite the agreement on the role of recreation, uncertainty remained as to what it was. Aquinas also emphasised the importance of intention in determining the validity of any ludi, and of playing with moderation to reach an appropriate level of joy. Another reason, therefore, for supplicants mentioning recreation was that the definition, definition of it was attractively elastic. To indicate their recreational intentions, they didn't have to refer directly to recreation, but simply to words that were strongly associated with it. Phrases indicating their joyful or playful intentions, is bâté, du visé, and so on, were all meant to indicate their recreational state. And in fact, some supplicants use these words in conjunction with recreation, referring also to the recreational manner of their conduct, joyeusement, and so on. And thus it was that an astonishing number of homicides in Burgundian lands were apparently committed by men who were joyful, playful, and in good cheer. Now, the, there were quite a, was quite a variety of activities that supplicants presented as a recreation, some of which uh, might have modified the homilist. So supplicants had themselves enjoying communal feasts, weddings or dances with respectable ladies, or musical singing. Others uh, were simply being playing, playful or, or just playing. A few played games arising spontaneously, won a snowball contest. More played organised games uh, like uh, tennis, uh, other ball games. Others still went shooting, or hunting, uh, or, or jousting. 
But here, notably with jousting, the games mentioned by supplicants are already at the edge of the homilist's interpretation of legitimate recreation. And other joyous amusements, so-called, were difficult to classify as anything but immoral. Supplicants in 53 letters have themselves as batons with less respectable ladies in brothels, although these were called women of joyeuse vie. But the most cited activity, appearing in, in a whopping 857 letters, uh, in which supplicants are claimed to be in sociable fellowship with others and thus intending amusement, was tavern going, the perennial bugbear of the homilist. So of the 65 letters in which supplicants specifically use the word recreation, 45 do so inside taverns. And the most cited type of game mentioned in 65 letters was one they mostly conducted in taverns, dicing or other gambling games. So supplicants, or their canny notaries or lawyers, clearly thought it worth presenting themselves as recreational, however much this might stretch the homilist's sense of the term. And so part of the purpose was to set up a contrast between their behaviour and that of their opponents. Invariably, opponents are the very opposite of joyous, the first to act violently. And in the process, some supplicants present their own patently aggressive acts as playful, so, for example, Jean de François, a humble supplicant uh, from a village in Flanders, on his way home one evening, on October evening in 1459, killed a man who had attacked him. Jean concedes that he had a little earlier thrust his fist through the window of his soon-to-be-deceased uh, assailant. But this was no aggressive uh, act of vandalism. Instead, one carried out par manière d'espatement, Jean had bien bu, he was joyeux, and by dis predisposition, légier de faire joyeuseté. Other supplicants were even more ingenious, representing their instruments of homicide as tools intended primarily for joy. Arnoul, with his recreational cannon, was not alone in claiming his weapon to be a plaything. Jean Basman from Dijon, on the 23rd of October 1450, confessed that he was moved to anger by the devil's temptation to knife his opponent. This opponent, though, was famed as poorly self-governed, and he had assaulted Jean with injurious words, not a man then inclined to peace or joy. Jean, however, was just such a man. Even his small knife that found its way into his opponent's neck, and it was such a very small knife, uh, had simply been meant for recreation, used to whittle a tiny stick par manière de passer dans. Well, there are several conclusions about recreation I could, I could follow up. I've said nothing about its gendered nature. Male petitioners uh, present themselves as recreational to project an image of acceptable masculinity. By playing well in contrast to their opponents, they prove themselves to be well-governed men, worthy of pardon. Female practitioners, peti petitioners, sorry, form only a small fraction of the pardon cases, but it's telling about acceptable modes of female behavior that not one of them gives any sense of being amused by a joyful activity. The broader but tentative conclusion I want to make, though, is to do with the social importance attached to recreation. Totting up the number of pardon letters in which supplicants claimed before their crime to be in a recreational state shows that it exceeds half of the total, a greater proportion than those that refer to supplicants as engaged in work or divine service. Given that the whole purpose of petitions was to win a pardon, and given that these petitions were all successful, we can surmise that the strategy of claiming recreation was highly useful. We can also begin to see, therefore, how much weight was placed on recreation within late medieval society. Supplicants evidently expected that those with the power to grant them a pardon, and those within their local communities who had to ratify the pardon, scrutinised the details of their recreation in both its form and manner. Perhaps it was only after this period, the clearer separation 
and a sense of autonomy emerge between work and free time or leisure time. In the later Middle Ages, recreation remained theoretically subordinate to the activities of work and divine service. But as these pardon letters demonstrate, there was a strong sense that a distinct time existed outside times for these other activities. And that's how one passed that time was already a matter of intense social interest and rhetorical value. Thanks for listening.